You didn't really think Clayton Kershaw was going to leave, did you? We're going to talk a little bit about the Lakers' immediate future, but not go in depth about LeBron James's groin with all hope. And a Super Bowl champ turned NFL analyst thinks the Chargers are kind of stupid. Hi, I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. It is November 11, 2022. I'm somewhere in the high desert, going to go out to see my mom. Hopefully, it'll be a lovely day with the family. But before then, let's talk LA sports. If you like the content we put out about LA, clickety clack the like button, clickety clack the subscribe button. There's a notifications bell. Hit that. It'll let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And yes, comment. I don't know anybody else up here. Mom can only talk about so much, right? So before we go through the news and notes, quick look at the scoreboard. Kevin Fiala scored the game winner in overtime. Kings 2, Chicago 1. Meanwhile, Drew Peterson scored 21 points last night as USC basketball rights the ship. They defeated Alabama State 96 to 58. Meanwhile, today, USC football. The eighth ranked Trojans are back in action. They will host Colorado at 6.30 p.m. There is a preview of the game on the USC playlist. By the way, late breaking note, wide receiver Jordan Addison is expected to play tonight. Meanwhile, Long Beach State will play eighth ranked UCLA basketball. That game is at 8 p.m. Uh, in the season opener for the Bruins, five players scored in double figures. Not a bad way to kick off the year. Also, Sacramento's at the Lakers. That game is at 7.30. Uh, LeBron James is said to be day-to-day -day with a groin injury, but that day is not tonight. He is out against the Kings. So yesterday was the beginning of multiple winter meetings that happened in Major League Baseball. The Dodgers, they did not extend a qualifying offer to starting pitcher Clayton Kershaw because they are apparently working on a one-year deal anyway. That deal would be worth $17 million. And honestly, good, right? Can you imagine letting one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history go? Three Cy Youngs, an MVP, <clears throat> over 2,800 strikeouts, 197 wins, 87 losses. I try not to go too heavy on the religion. I believe in God. But let's say you're an atheist. Even if you were Christopher Hitchens and Clayton Kershaw left, Christopher Hitchens would go, why God, why? Come on, Clayton Kershaw in another uniform? No, let's not go there. The Dodgers did, however, extend qualifying offers to shortstop Trey Turner and starting pitcher Tyler Anderson. To uh, recap, a qualifying offer, if the player refuses the qualifying offer and chooses to sign elsewhere, LA would get a supplemental draft pick, and that's one of the ways that they keep their farm systems supple, if you will. They declined an option on Justin Turner, who is 37. Had he stayed and uh, the Dodgers had taken the option, he would have been in line for about $16 million this year. Now, granted, he could still resign with LA. Obviously, if the Dodgers are thinking that, they're trying to get him for significantly less, which makes sense. The Athletic, by the way, also ranks the Dodgers as the second most likely team to sign free agent outfielder Aaron Judge. The Yankees are considered most likely to retain the services of an outfielder who hit 60 plus home runs last year. There's a website I'm kind of iffy about, the Belcher Report, for lack of a better way of calling it. There was this wide ranging report on the Lakers yesterday. And uh, they are basically saying that LeBron James, quote, does not want to waste a season of his higher level playing days in hopes of incoming reinforcements for 2023-24, unquote. The report, I will buy that because it's patently obvious. Why would you bust your ass for no reason if you're an elite talent like LeBron James? Duh. The report also refuted the idea that is 
made the waves around uh, the interweb about trading Anthony Davis, but suggests that teams are inquiring with the Lakers about Russell Westbrook. Now look, none of this stuff is breaking news. We're just basically saying it for the sake of saying it. To me, especially with that stuff about Russell Westbrook, it doesn't take a lot of uh, brain cells to rub together to figure it out. It seems to me that the Lakers are just trying to drum up a market for the guy. Yeah, maybe a couple of teams might have called. This isn't exactly a hot property to trade. I bring all that up so we don't have to go in depth, by the way, about LeBron James's groin. Steve Young, famous for two things. Beating the Chargers in the Super Bowl in the 1990s and being Mormon. Not that I have a problem with either, I suppose. But Steve Young just buried the Chargers. You might remember he played a good chunk of his NFL career up at San Francisco. The Niners are playing the Chargers this weekend. They asked about what he thought of the, of the, uh, of the Bolts. He wasn't nice. Joseph Smith might be blushing a little bit. But uh, what he said, frankly, kind of rings true. Hey, he thinks Justin Herbert is a generational talent, and this is what he bases most of his opinion on. Justin Herbert, a generational talent, but, quote, he's not getting the help philosophically. But he's also not getting it with talent. Also, strategically, who are we? Who are the Chargers? Offensively, they're, I don't know. I always kind of make fun of the Cliff Kingsbury, Kyle Murray kind of wing it offense. And I feel the Chargers are that way with less of a plan, unquote. I want to give Chargers fans just a few moments to rub something on their groin for that kick in the nuts that, Sean, that Steve Young just gave you guys. I understand. It's not pleasant to get kicked down there. Steve Young was kicking you guys down there just now until both of his feet got tired. If you need a moment, I understand. Another Chargers news, they released defensive tackle Jerry Tillery. Now, Tillery was a first round pick back in 2019. Uh, he basically struggled against the run throughout the, his career. And the Chargers have similarly struggled with the run. I don't necessarily know if this solves any problems, but at least it's a commitment to saying to yourself, we got to get players in there who know how to stop a running back once or twice. Rams defensive coordinator Raheem Morris, who has been an interim head coach, has an idea of what's going on in Sean McVay's mind with the state of the Rams. Quote, don't tell him I said this. He's extremely spoiled. Out here in L.A., we've done a lot of winning. This is the most adversity he's had, unquote. Now, Morris was saying this kind of tongue-in-cheek. Obviously, if you read the quote, it's kind, of, it's kind of clear. But he did say that this was actually a golden opportunity for McVay to get even better as a coach. It's easy to go and, quote, coach speak, unquote, when times are good. All the rah-rah stuff and this, that, and the other. This is now Sean McVay's time to actually see if he can grow when times are not good because most teams do not have nothing but good times for years and years. Even Bill Belichick right now is stinking up the joint, would you say? A beat writer, by the way, for the Rams suggests that if Matthew Stafford does not start on Sunday and if John Wolford is plugged in, that they should go for it and also develop some red zone plays for third string quarterback, Bryce Perkins. By the way, if you saw the game uh, against Tampa last Sunday, it was basically both sides going three and out all day long. The Rams are the team with the most three and outs in the NFL. Craziness, just crazy. Three, three snaps and a punt for the defending Super Bowl champs all day long. 
I mentioned earlier about the LA Kings and how they won in overtime last night. One of the things that they are preaching is togetherness. And it's not just simply empty words. If you want a hint as to how close this team is, the veterans who won the Cups or who were there during the Salad Days and the prospects, the next generation, if you will, ESPN broached the topic with Drew Doughty. Doughty had to cut the interview a little bit short because he was on his way to having lunch and talking hockey with high draft pick Brent Clark. So apparently the uh, next generation and the veterans have a healthy respect for each other. There are some uh, transactions involving the Kings. Forward Alex Turcotte has been activated. He's assigned to the Ontario Reign. Uh, Turcotte, as you might recall, this was considered to be a bit of a make or break year, but he hasn't even been able to play, let alone have full contact practice for quite a while. He's dealing with a long-term concussion. And by the way, uh, speaking of high draft picks, we mentioned that Quinton uh, Byfield, he's been out for a few weeks with a non-disclosed illness. He too, he lost some weight. He's trying to get his stamina back in Ontario. In Quinton Byfield's absence, Rasmus Kapari was promoted from Ontario to the Kings. Kapari's been playing third line center. The Kings are five and two since he's been promoted. Now I'm not trying to say it's all Kapari's doing, obviously but the results are there. The LA Galaxy have made a second trade this week. They have sent defenseman Derek Williams to DC United for general allocation money. Now DC United had the league's worst defense last year by a country mile. They allowed 71 goals. But you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, didn't the Galaxy need defense? What the hell are they doing? trading players away for either money or cap space. Well, there is an idea that is floating around that they are getting all of this general allocation money. And by the way, don't ask me to explain what general allocation money is. I literally have no idea how to explain the MLS salary cap. But one idea is the Galaxy are making these deals to free up a l enough money to make a play for center back Aaron Long, who is a former MLS Defender of the Year. By the way, memo to both LAFC and Galaxy fans, the expansion draft in MLS is today. Both teams had to make players eligible to uh, be drafted by incoming St. Louis City. And I must say, I've worked in St. Louis. I wouldn't wish living in St. Louis on Kevin Cabral. It's so craptacular over there. I feel bad, straight up. I'm not even an LAFC fan, and I wouldn't want any of those guys to have to live in St. Louis. Good luck and Godspeed to whoever gets drafted by them. I swear to God. Finally, with LAFC, MLS Soccer posed three questions in the off season for the new champs. Only two of them were worth repeating, so we'll get through them here. One is, will Gareth Bale return? Good question. See, for all we know, he may retire after the World Cup. He wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire. He wasn't like Zlatan Ibrahimovic for LAFC. Granted, he scored a goal in MLS Cup, I know that, but he missed a boatload of games. We don't even know if the man is ever fit, or for that matter, fits well with his teammates. And then the next question for LAFC, who stays? There's a lot of players that can go. Jose Sefuentes, a midfielder, he's likely going to be playing overseas next year. Same for Diego Palacios. But they also have four free agents, including defender Ryan Hollingshead. So if you're an LAFC fan, could you guys basically be one and done? Just a question. You tell me. I'm willing to hear you out. Now, just so you know, later today, we're going to be posting previews for both the Rams and the Chargers on their games this weekend. If you would love to comment, love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed talking LA sports with me today, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We talk LA sports every day. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Actually, later today as well. Faith Langelinos is a Kia and Corte Queso production. Take care.